Lord Lexton. Uh, my Lords, I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. My Lords, responsibility for the investigation and prosecution of individuals rests with the police and prosecuting authorities. The right Honourable Lady Justice Hallett, DBE, has been appointed to conduct an independent review into the administrative scheme to deal with so-called on-the-runs. This inquiry will provide a full public account of the operation and extent of the scheme. I expect the report to be completed by the end of June 2014 for the purpose of its full publication. I know my noble friend uh, fully understands the uh, sense of shock and outrage which now exists uh, as a result of the revelation a few weeks ago that the last government uh, arranged for uh, secret letters to be sent to over 150 uh, terrorist suspects at the behest of Sinn Féin. Uh, It uh, is better, said Mr Gerry Adams, uh, that there is an invisible process, words quoted at the recent Downey trial uh, before its collapse. Uh, Why on earth did this government uh, continue the shameful collusion uh, with uh, Sinn Féin by allowing more letters to be sent out uh, by officials of the Northern Ireland office uh, until the end of 2012? The government has made clear that the letters confer no permanent immunity from prosecution Could my noble friend give us an absolute assurance that the police in all parts of our country are fully aware that we want them to uh, gather evidence and bring terrorists to justice for their shameful crimes? My Lords, um, if at any time we had been presented with a scheme that amounted to immunity, exemption or amnesty, we would have stopped it consistent with the opposition of both coalition parties to the previous government's Northern Ireland Offences Bill in 2005, which proposed an amnesty. The the current government continued the scheme on the basis uh, of continuing with existing cases to uh, the overwhelming part until 2012, and continued work on it until, until the early part of 2013. Uh, noble Lords must wait for the full outcome of the review to know full details. My Lords, um, the Noble Baroness has given two sets of answers to written questions recently and made it clear that the inquiry to be conducted by Lady Justice Hallett has no powers of compulsion. Why is this? Why is Lady Justice Hallett constrained by having this inquiry and not an inquiry under the Inquiries Act 2005? Uh, My Lords, this is an an administrative review and it will not be conducted according to the 2005 Act. This Government has always been very clear that it has reservations about the use of public inquiries to deal with the past Uh, There is the issue of uh, the length that many of them take, and there is in this case a clear public interest in early publication of this report. My Lords, I wonder, is it the intention of the government that this inquiry or review, as it's now termed, is going to go ahead without uh, having uh, heard from the people who designed the process namely the then Secretary of State and Mr Gerard Adams. Uh, and does it, is it satisfactory to help try to operate without having the power of compelling Mr Adams to come and give evidence? My Lords, um, officials of the, uh, government officials uh, will of course appear before the inquiry and will give evidence. Others will um, be invited to do so. And it is up entirely to Lady Justice Hallett how she reads her remit in this regard and uh, from whom she uh, will request evidence and how far she takes the scope of her inquiry. But she is asked, for the reasons I have already referred to, uh, to report by the end of June at the latest. May I raise a matter which does not seek to touch upon the merits or the demerits of the scheme? a purely technical legal matter. Can the noble baroness tell the House 
whether in relation to any person who has received a letter as described in the question, whether that person is in any way protected from the law of citizen's arrest or would it in fact need legislation to bring such a result about? The intention of the letters uh, was to present a statement of fact at a point in time. And as such, it did not grant immunity exemption or an, uh, they did not grant immunity exemption or amnesty. In order to do that, would have required legislation. My lords, my, my lords uh, we should never forget those members of our armed forces who lost their lives in the Hyde Park bombing, their families and all victims of the other atrocities associated with the troubles in Northern Ireland. <laughs> As part of a complex process that made peace and stability in Northern Ireland possible, the last Labour government issued on their own letters to people who had reason to believe they might be under investigation. As stated by both the opposition and the government, this was not an amnesty, and letters made clear to recipients that should evidence come to light in the future, they could be prosecuted. However, this this scheme has once again drawn attention to the need for long-term solution on issues of the past. Can the Minister reassure the House that she still believes a positive outcome will be reached from the ongoing all-party talks and is the Government fully engaged in trying to make this happen? I, uh, I, I share the, uh, un, the, um, the sentiments of the Noble Lord. Um, in relation to sympathies towards those uh, families of victims, indeed victims throughout the Troubles. And uh, I, get, I understand entirely the considerable anger that the events of the last few weeks have stirred um, among them and among others in the community in Northern Ireland. I am sure that the, um, uh, those who were in government during the early years of the On the Run scheme will welcome the opportunity in due course to give evidence. There are five inquiries of various sorts being undertaken into this process. I'm sure they will welcome the opportunity to give evidence. And I can confirm that the government is committed to ensuring that there is a long-term solution uh, to the problems of the past in Northern Ireland. My Lord, will, will my noble friend consider extending the terms of this inquiry so that we can know whether or not there were any letters or similar inducements given to assist the progress of the ceasefire talks which led eventually to the Good Friday Agreement. It is my understanding that certain proceedings were held up in order to assist that process. It would be interesting to know if that is indeed true. The, the terms of reference of Lady Justice Hallett's inquiry have been set out and indeed work has started on this and, but I am uh, sure that if she were to come upon evidence uh, that led her to be concerned about issues of the nature that my noble friend has referred to then it would be within her remit for her to make recommendations uh, on that for the future. Baroness Benjamin. My Lords, I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. My Lords, the Government aims to improve education for all and our policies to achieve this are working. Attainment for black pupils is increasing strongly and performance gaps have closed and are narrowing substantially. In the last five years, we've seen a 17% increase in black Caribbean pupils atten attaining five GCSEs, including English and Maths, up from 36 to 53%. And for black African pupils, the achievement rate now stands at 61.2%, above the national average of 60.6%. My Lords, students of Caribbean heritage are at the very bottom of the attainment league table. Chinese and Indian students are at the top. 
but yet they're always lumped together as if they're one group, giving the impression that ethnic minority students are outperforming white students. So can my noble friend, the Minister, tell the House what is being done to ensure that Caribbean heritage students are attaining the government's GCSC benchmark and going on to further and higher education, and how is the Education Endowment Foundation being encouraged to use the substantial government funds to address this problem? I'd like to assure my noble friend that we do publish detailed attainment data by specific ethnic category, and schools in Ofsted study their internal data on this carefully to ensure that all pupils are making good progress. Sponsored academies have substantially higher intakes of black pupils in the rest of the state sector, and those pupils are significantly outperforming pupils from similar backgrounds in maintained schools. Sponsored secondary academies have 79% more black Caribbean pupils and are increasing their performance at double that of other state schools, and sponsored primary academies have 38% more black Caribbean pupils are now increasing their performance at three times that of other state schools. And disadvantaged black Caribbean pupils are outperforming the disadvantaged group as a whole. 45% are achieving the GCSE measure compared to the national average of 41% and 33% for white disadvantaged pupils. Through the pupil premium, we're providing $2.5 billion uh, this year that will benefit over half of black pupils and the EEF is funding a number of projects, including an increasing pupil, pupil motivation project to help black pupils. My lords, my lords, is not one of the aspects of this. Of... Would the Minister agree with me that teacher um, expectation is one of the greatest impacts, has the greatest impact on pupil achievement? But apart from what is going on in schools, would he also agree with me? that schemes of mentoring, such as those of the Amos Bursary or XPL, can have a huge impact on the achievement of pupils by their one-to-one programmes of help to those particular pupils. Yeah, yeah. I agree entirely with the noble lady on both points. I'd like to think that uh, low teacher expectations... Uh, for particularly black pupils are a thing of the past, and I think that's proven certainly in sponsored academies. Uh, As far as mentoring schemes are concerned, I agree entirely with her. In my own school, we participated in the Mayor's Mentoring Programme, uh, which provide mentoring relationships for a 1,000 black boys across the capital. Uh, Chance UK is an excellent charity providing uh, mentoring, and Think Forward, which was developed by the Private Equity Foundation and funded by the EEF, provides highly trained coaches to work with disadvantaged 14-year-olds in schools in East London. My Lords. Uh, my Lords, I wonder if the noble Lord, the Minister, uh, could uh, tell the House what assessment Her Majesty's Government have made of the impact uh, on educational attainment of the absorption of the ethnic minority achievement uh, 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 awards into the, uh, direct, the dedicated schools grant, which was uh, done some months ago. Uh, certainly, the impact was substantial, uh, and I'd have to write to the right resident president to give him more details, which I will. My lord, my lord, if uh, I think an important. Lawrence, 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 Lawrence. My lord. What happens after school and university is equally important. The latest figure shows that 45% of young black young people in the UK are unemployed. Can the minister say what steps is the government taking to stop the over-representation of young black and African Caribbean people um, amongst the unemployed? Uh, Well, I think our apprenticeship programme is very much aimed at this. And, of course, we've also reformed... Uh, vocational qualifications. Uh, It is the case that in the past too many of these qualifications had no real job value 
uh, but were over-promoted in equivalence tables. Uh, we've, Alison Wolfe uh, did a study on this, and we've dramatically re uh, reduced the number of uh, equivalent vocational qualifications which count, which will be of much more value to all pupils, and I think it will help particularly black pupils. My Lords, uh, is my noble friend the Minister aware that a recent study by the Institute of Education found that one of the major concerns that black parents was that teachers, teachers generally predetermined the kind of pupils... So was Baroness Lawrence. So was Baroness Lawrence. Yes. Capable of academic success and that some teachers had lower expectations of black and minority ethnic students uh, and the black pu uh, pupils are more likely to be entered for lower tier exams, meaning these students are only able to achieve C and a D grade uh, as a maximum. Uh, well, I'd like to think, as I say, that this is a thing of the past, but in order to improve... Uh, teaching leaders. Uh, <laughs> I, I, think one, I think one could say that's a very fair cop. <laughs> but I think I'm entitled to. Uh, the Teach First programme, uh, which we've quadrupled, Teaching Leaders Scheme, Future Leading Scheme, and shortly to introduce the Talented Leaders programme, should all in ensure that we raise uh, the standard of teaching and ensure that any uh, prejudice in this regard is a thing of the past. Lord Hilton. My Lords, I beg leave to ask the question in my name on the order paper. My Lords, we have made clear to both parties that the current negotiations represent a unique opportunity to achieve a just and lasting solution to the conflict. As the Prime Minister said during his recent visit to the region, we need to keep our eyes firmly fixed on the prize of peace, a secure Israel safe inside her borders and a state of Palestine living alongside, with all the benefits that that would bring. My Lords, is it not shameful that 40 years after the last international war in the region and 20 years after the Oslo agreements, there is still no final status agreement. Will they insist that the government of Israel make their own proposals for ending the blockade of Gaza and the military and colonial occupation of the West Bank? Otherwise, world opinion will insist on boycott, disinvestment, and sanctions. Will Europe and the Middle East use their economic power to counterbalance the huge strength of Israel? Will Her Majesty's Government discuss this urgently? Uh, I know the Noble Lord has uh, written to me on a number of occasions uh, in relation uh, to this uh, matter, and I, like him, like all members of this House, would like uh, the Middle East peace process resolved. We would like to see a secure Israel living alongside a secure and viable Palestinian state, but we continue to judge that negotiations are the best route to achieve that solution that ends the conflict once and for all, and Secretary Kerry's, Kerry's tireless efforts to provide, do provide a, a, a real opportunity to to achieve this goal and therefore we're urging uh, both parties to show the bold leadership that is needed to seize this moment. Does my noble friend not accept that the negotiations are doomed and Mr Netanyahu and his cabinet know that they are doomed so long as Israel <coughs> goes on colonising the West Bank illegally and relentlessly? Is that not the reality and what are we going to do about it? My Lords, the situation on the ground continues to change and it's why I've stood at this dispatch box over the last 12 months on a number of occasions and I've said that this provides a unique opportunity to try and make progress. The uh, discussions that Secretary Kerry, Kerry is leading uh, are the discussions that we are supporting and we are urging both sides who have said at this stage that they're still prepared to talk to get back to the table and to try and achieve a resolution. My Lords, could the, could the Minister tell us what explanation Her Majesty's Government received from the Israeli Government? about why they didn't release the fourth group of Palestinian prisoners uh, last week? Uh, 
the noble lords will be aware that, of course, this was the fourth uh, tranche uh, of uh, uh, prisoner releases which uh, were uh, agreed uh, last year. Uh, the first three having taken place, the fourth one now having been delayed. Uh, the noble lord will be aware that there is, there is, of course, a difference of opinion as to how these uh, matters are seen. Israel felt that these uh, uh, prisoner releases were directly linked to the peace talks. The Palestinians believe that these were directly linked to no further action at the UN. I think the actual discussions that took place at that stage were clearly vague. What I take comfort from at this stage, however, is that both parties have indicated that they are prepared to come back to the negotiating table because we think that's where progress will be made. And the Minister agree with me that, the, that the, um, all Palestinian, the Palestinian unilateral activity at the UN and other international organisations has been very counterproductive. And would she not agree that it's surprising the EU hasn't used further efforts to bring Mr Abbas back to the table, given the 5.6 billion euros in aid that have gone to the Palestinian Authority in the last 10 years? I think, uh, my lords, it's not the government's decision to be taking sides in this matter. I think there have been actions on both sides which have been counterproductive uh, in this uh, matter. I think there are things that both sides agreed to that have not been delivered upon, and that's why we are stressing once again that they need to get back to the negotiating table because this is the only place where a long, true settlement will be made. My lords, I thank the noble lady of the minister for her written response to a question that I asked in a recent debate about demolitions and settlements in the Palestinian occupied territories. Can the Minister tell us, did the Prime Minister raise these questions with Mr Netanyahu when he visited Israel? And if he did, what was Mr Netanyahu's justification for continuing these illegal breaches of Palestinian human rights? Uh, the issue of human rights was raised by my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, on his visit uh, uh, to Israel and the uh, occupied territories in uh, mid-March when he was there. Um, I, I don't know what the response was, um, and if, uh, I have, if I get that response, uh, I'm sure I'll write to the Noble Lord. Minister, tell us. My Lords, it's extremely unfortunate, that, if unsurprising, that the talks are seeming to be breaking down, but instead of the blame game which undoubtedly will follow with the Palestinians blaming the Israelis for not releasing prisoners and for continuing to build on the West Bank and Israel accusing the Palestinians of uh, going to the UN before they agree to go and not agreeing to, uh, that the Jewish state exists, uh, instead of all that, shouldn't we be thinking of a plan B? And is the, this government thinking of any uh, advice that it would give to both parties to bring them to some sort of agreement, at least in the interim period. Um, the foreign, uh, my right honourable friend, the Foreign Secretary, uh, spoke with uh, uh, President Abbas uh, last week and is hoping to speak to the Israelis uh, later on uh, this week. There has been an unprecedented EU package and a, uh, a package that we have been part of, which is on the table socially, economically, politically, developmentally, uh, if this uh, peace uh, deal was to be reached. And that's why we keep stressing to both parties, I agree with the Noble Lord, this isn't about having a blame game, but this is about continuing to support a process which at this stage is still on the table. Can my noble friend, the Minister, tell us, uh, since the uh, resumption of talks between the Palestinian and the Israelis last year, how many times has the Government of Israel announced new settlements in the occupied areas and how that is helping the negotiations? Uh, there have been further settlement announcements since uh, negotiations resumed uh, last year. Firstly, on the 8th uh, of uh, August of last year. Uh, secondly, on the 30th of October of last year. Uh, further announcements on the 30th of this, uh, the 3rd of November of last year, and then a further approval on the 6th of January uh, of this year. But, like I said before, this is not an issue of playing a blame game. Both sides. Um, are doing things which were not agreed to, and that's why we want them to get back to the negotiating table and do what was agreed. Baroness Faulkner of Margravine. My Lords, I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. My Lords, uh, the Prime Minister's decision to commission a review uh, was taken on the grounds of national interest against a backdrop, uh, backdrop of substantial recent change particularly in the Middle East and North Africa. Well, the review will make sure we have a thorough understanding of the Muslim Brotherhood, its impact, its influence, 
on our national security and our interests in stability and prosperity in the Middle East. My noble friend will be aware that the Muslim Brotherhood is a pan-Islamic organisation which takes very different forms in different countries. If the government believes that the Brotherhood might be involved in violent extremism, then why do they not use existing <coughs> counter-terrorism laws to prosecute them in the courts? If, on the other hand, this inquiry is being driven at the behest of Saudi Arabia to discredit the Brotherhood, then may I respectfully suggest to my noble friend that it is the U United Kingdom government and indeed United Kingdom foreign policy which risks being discredited by portraying the Brotherhood in the eyes of the many Muslim supporters that it has around the world as victims of a politically motivated government acting on behest of an authoritarian foreign power, Saudi Arabia. I wonder if he can tell the House whether the results of the inquiry will be made public. Yeah. Well, my, uh, my lords, um, I, I think I can say my first answer made it quite clear that this is about the UK's national interests and the UK government forming its own view. Uh, the review will make sure that we have a thorough understanding of the Muslim Brotherhood, its um, impact, its influence on our national security and on our other national interests in stability and prosperity in the Middle East. Uh, we're not talking about the view of another government, we're talking about this government, and the review will consult widely with experts, regional governments, the EU, US partners, and the UK government will make up its own mind. Uh, if press reports are correct, that this review is being headed by Her Britannic Majesty's Ambassador to Saudi Arabia, does it not put Sir John Jenkins in an extremely invidious position, given that the, the, the government to which he is accredited takes every step possible, as the noble lady has said, to discredit and to destroy the Muslim Brotherhood? Yeah. Now, I can't uh, agree with the noble lord, or th though he speaks with a great deal of authority. He will know that Sir John Jenkins um, has been asked to leave the review uh, because he's one of our most senior diplomats and his extensive knowledge uh, of the Arab world. And his role is to serve Her Majesty's government. Um, he was not and is not chosen for his current role as ambassador to Saudi Arabia. Um, he's not working alone, and he'll draw on independent advice uh, from other places. My Lords, the Noble Lord Minister referred to a review, but the words used by the Prime Minister was investigation on inquiry. There may be some difference. It would be helpful, I think, to more information. But can I ask if he's taken the opportunity to talk to Noble Lady Baroness Vasi about this, or it impresses your Lordship's House for knowledge of such issues? Because a report in the Financial Times says that a senior government figure reported on tensions, it says, between the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and the Prime Minister's Office on this, says this cuts against what the FCO has already been doing in this area, both domestically and in the Middle East. It risks turning supporters of a moderate non-violent organisation that campaigns for democracy into radicals. Can I ask, is there a tension at the heart of government, and is it a review or an investigation? Not at all, my lords. Uh, my noble friend and I are at one on the issue. <laughs> my lords, can my noble friend tell me in the House, will the ambassador go on being an ambassador while he's also leading the inquiry? And if so, is there a conflict of interest? Uh, ways, I'm sure, will be found whereby his duties as, uh, as uh, ambassador can indeed be uh, delegated where necessary. Uh, but uh, he has been appointed to that, that role as um, ambassador and he will continue to undertake that role. I see no conflict of interest. As the noble Lord Lord Wright recognised, the diplomatic skills that Sir John Jenkins has are essential for a proper understanding of the situation. My Lords, my Lords, um, could the noble Lord the Minister tell us how many other reviews or investigations have been conducted in this manner into groups we have been concerned about I can't remember that we actually undertook any in this manner of the groups we were worried about in the three years that I was a minister. 
No, well, that was a decision for the previous government. This government's made up its own mind that it wants to know more about the Muslim Brotherhood and its influence on politics in this country and on groups in this country. So I, I do hope that uh, they will also understand this is a British review conducted by the British government. I was asked earlier and I didn't give an answer. Obviously, it is an internal review for the government itself, but um, uh, it will be expected that uh, Sir John Jenkins and the group will want to make some of its findings public. This is manifestly a sordid... Right, right. As, right, right. as, this, right, as this, right. I'm grateful. As this is manifestly a sordid plot from Saudi Arabia, wouldn't it be more interesting if the HMG had conversations with the Saudi government about allowing women to drive cars in that country? Oh. <laughs> well, I don't think that question is worthy of uh, my, my noble friends. Uh, the noble Lord Wright was trying to get in as I had named him. With the, with the, with the permission of the House, I just wish to make a very, very brief remark. As a former ambassador to Saudi Arabia, I would myself find it extremely difficult if anyone were to ask me to head this review. Well, all I can say in answer to that, I'm very pleased that Sir John Jenkins has not found it so. I'm sure he'll do an excellent job in the national interest.